I want to talk today about a practice that I think at least some people in this audience uh, are familiar with, and that is the practice of living in imaginary worlds. Uh, because today, millions of people all over the world live in imaginary worlds. They do so communally and for prolonged periods of time. Uh, now, we usually associate this activity with fantasy fans. Um, fantasy fans, obviously, are the most visible uh, dwellers of imaginary worlds. Uh, certainly, Trekkies are visible. Uh, I grew up, in fact, as a Trekkie, and I've just committed a faux pas, because now it's more politically correct to refer to them as Trekkers. Uh, I apologize to some of you if I've actually, uh, actually insulted you. I don't mean to. Um, so certainly, there are Trekkies. There are Star Wars fans. Um, and in fact, having a Star Wars-themed wedding is a really good idea. Because if the force is ever going to be with you, it's going to be on your wedding night. <laughs> and we also have comic book fans who are now invading our movie theaters. And I actually think this is kind of good, clean fun. I like to see them in the lobbies. Uh, I do get a pain of anxiety, though, when I see them, because I worry that I'm going to be the one sitting behind Thor throughout the whole movie. Uh, <laughs> And, of course, uh, fans of online computer games, World of Warcraft, which has over uh, 11 million members. Now, fans invest a great deal of time in making these imaginary worlds real. Uh, they'll create grammars of invented imaginary languages. Or they'll do other things, like they'll take perfectly good poetry and they'll translate it into unpronounceable languages. Uh, to be or not to be. ta pa ta ba it loses something in the translation. <laughs> and there's a whole scholarly industry devoted to imaginary worlds. So you can get dictionaries, encyclopedias, atlases of imaginary worlds. Now, I think all of this is kind of quintessentially geeky behavior. Uh, we might assume that this is a sort of behavior of maladroit teenagers who can't face the real world. Uh, and famously, in an episode of Saturday Night Live, William Shatner lectured Trekkers. He told them that they ought to get a life. But in our media-saturated world today, the practice of fantasy fans has gone mainstream. Arguably, we are all geeks now. Many of us are living in imaginary worlds, even people who would never pick up a book of fantasy. So for example, James Joyce fans, um, they celebrate Bloomsbury, Bloomsday every year. Uh, they actually dress up in costumes, just like Star Trek fans do. They may even be translating Hamlet into James Joyce, for all I know. And Fantasy also pervades our life, the fabric of our everyday life. So here is a plaque that actually exists in San Francisco. It's on a street in which uh, a character in Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon is murdered by another character. And the plaque is actually on the same street. But there's nothing on this plaque to indicate that this is fictional. And furthermore, when we think of statues, we tend to think that they commemorate real people or real events. But today, you're just as likely to come across statues of fictional people, such as Rocky Balboa, or Mary Richards, or Dick Tracy, or Charlie Brown in Snoopy, or even the Man of Steel, <laughs> and Superman. <laughs> so I want to ask today, First, when did this practice of living in imaginary worlds communally and persistently begin, historically? And second, is it pure escapism, or does it mean something more? The answer to when it began is in the late 19th century, in the 1890s, with Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes was the first fictional character that adults pretended was real, and they also pretended that his creator, Arthur Conan Doyle, was fictional. And they actually wrote scholarly biographies trying to make this point, complete with footnotes and bibliographies. Uh, he was the first fictional character that had journals devoted to him, also making this case that Holmes existed and that if Arthur Conan Doyle existed, he was merely John Watson's literary agent. Uh, so really what happens with Sherlock Holmes is he becomes the first uh, imaginary world that adults inhabit communally and for prolonged periods of time this world becomes, in effect, a virtual world. It transcends any individual text, any individual reader. It's available 24-7. And it really becomes the template for all ex succeeding imaginary worlds, uh, the imaginary world of Middle Earth or Star Trek, Star Wars, and so on. Now, of course, there were earlier fads for imaginary characters and worlds in the 18th and early 19th centuries. But these differed markedly from what happened in the late 19th century. First of all, the earlier fads were very brief. Uh, 
The readers did not pretend that the characters were fictional and the creators didn't exist. Uh, and certainly, they didn't live in these worlds communally or persistently. This was because the, er the 18th and early 19th century was a religious period. And the middle classes were very ambivalent about the role of the imagination. Uh, they feared the imagination, in fact. They, they believed that if it was exercised, it would promote uh, unbounded desires, ungodly conduct. So they actually tried to restrict the imagination. A good example of this is the imaginary worlds created by the Bronte siblings in the 1820s. Now, these children created wonderful imaginary worlds. And they actually lived in them persistently and communally because they only had each other and these imaginary worlds. But their father was a Protestant uh, pastor. And he advised them to stop it because he said this was ungodly conduct. And Charlotte Bronte was so in love with her world that she continued to write about it into her 20s. But she also felt incredibly guilty about it. She feared that she was losing sight of the creator in idolatry of the creature. So she stopped. And she ended up writing realist uh, fiction instead. Now, the attitude towards the imagination begins to change in the mid-19th century, becomes less restrictive. And this is because of a whole variety of factors. There's an expanding climate of secularism. Uh, there's more leisure time for many among the middle classes. The new mass culture enables people to exercise their imaginations. And I think this is really reflected in the new children's literature of the 1860s. Prior to this, children's literature was very moralistic and preachy. It was designed to train little kids to be little adults. But with works such as Alice in Wonderland, these are works of fantasy. These are uh, full of whimsy and imagination. They're not connected, really, with the real world. And children are encouraged to live in them and engage with their imaginations. Interestingly, the kids who read these books in the 1860s became the generation of the 1880s and 90s that began to live in worlds such as that of Sherlock Holmes. Now, this brings us to the question, why fantastic worlds? Why not realist worlds? Literary realism was the dominant literary genre of the age. And you certainly had many realist imaginary worlds that would be perfectly suitable for ongoing habitation. Thomas Hardy's Wessex novels, for example, has a really great map. Why did they choose fantastic imaginary worlds? The answer to this question, I think, has to do with the 19th century craving for marvels and wonders that modernity seemed to deny. In the 19th century, there was a discourse, uh, a kind of conception of modernity, that it was disenchanted. Max Weber famously argued about the disenchantment of the world. And by that, he meant that modernity's emphasis on science and reason had discredited earlier supernatural and magical worldviews. The modern worldview, in contrast, was one that emphasizes science and reason and calculation. To want to be enchanted by marvels and wonders was to be infantile, it was to be regressive, it was to be irrational. Now, in reaction to this very dominant discourse of modern disenchantment, a group of British authors, beginning in the 1880s, created a new genre of imaginary, imaginative fantasy worlds. They connected these imaginary worlds directly with science, reason, and objectivity. These works contained fold-out detailed empirical maps. They contained objective photographs. They contained footnotes. They contained charts. They contained graphs. All of these were an effort to reconnect reason with the imagination, to re-enchant the modern world. The first work of the new romance was Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. And what really grabbed people about this work was the map of Treasure Island, this wonderful, fold-out, empirically rich, objectively detailed map. It was, in fact, created by an engineer, uh, Stevenson's father. And since Stevenson, maps of this sort, objective, empirical, and so on, are required for fantasy worlds. You can't get away without one. In fact, those fans of you who know about HBO's Game of Thrones know that the opening credit sequence is entirely devoted to this wonderful map of the fantasy world that George R. R. Martin created. H. Ryder Haggard was so inspired by, by Robert Louis Stevenson that for she, he created objective documentary evidence to support his imaginary world. So for example, the plot revolves around a potsherd a piece of evidence that um, the characters use to access uh, a lost civilization. Haggard created a real pot shirt. He had a friend design it. He had scholars create the inscriptions in classical Greek uh, and Latin and Old English. He then had it photographed and included as the frontispiece to his book. He also included throughout the text footnotes 
uh, uh, relating to real historical characters, real historical events. He was grounding his fantasy in the language of scientific objectivity. So thanks to the new romance, later genres which succeeded the new romance, such as science fiction and fantasy, require and do have maps, footnotes, charts, texts. These genres as well are all about reconciling enchantment with modernity, bringing together reason and the imagination, wonders in the modern world. This is why Sherlock Holmes was so popular, because he reconciled reason and the imagination. He called it the scientific use of the imagination. And for this reason, he became iconic in the late 19th century and remains iconic today. OK, so this is why adults chose fantastic imaginary worlds rather than realist ones to start living in. But the question still remains, how did they manage to do this communally and persistently? They were enabled to do this by new social networks that emerged in the late 19th century. For example, letters pages in fiction magazines. Editors created these to try to figure out what readers wanted. But readers began to discuss the fantasy worlds with one another in these pages. They became more emotionally invested in them, uh, and they began to elaborate them. Uh, and another innovation in the 1920s was when editors included the addresses of the letter writers. This enabled the letter writers to actually meet each other face to face. So in the 1930s, you get new social spaces, such as science fiction fan clubs, where fans can meet to live in these worlds and elaborate them. Uh, you get fanzines, where new imaginary worlds can be proposed and earlier ones that exist be discussed. And even conventions, where fans can spend days discussing these worlds, living in them communally and persistently. It's these new social networks uh, that have been replicated uh, by the internet today, which has made this practice far more widespread, uh, easy, and indeed popular. OK, well, having said this, I want to now address the question of whether this is all mere escapism. Of course it's escapism. That's the primary function of imaginary worlds. But I think they also have important social functions. First of all, imaginary worlds, as, you, as we've already suggested, reconcile uh, creative thinking, the creative imagination, and rational analysis. Any person in this room who has ever played Dungeons & Dragons or World of Warcraft knows that these are worlds of mathcraft. You have to be pretty statistically savvy to succeed in these games. And so these games certainly encourage thinking outside the box, creative thinking, but they also encourage hard-nosed, rational thinking, which is very important if we're going to confront many of the issues that, that we do have today, because wishful thinking is not going to do it. And it's no coincidence, in fact, that many of our most innovative thinkers and scientists are science fiction fans or fantasy fans. Uh, Paul Krugman, I think many of you know, the Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, is a major geek. And he'll admit that. Uh, he has acknowledged that he decided to become an economist after reading Isaac Asimov's The Foundation Trilogy. Second, imaginary worlds provide safe spaces uh, to actually reimagine the real world. It is politically relevant. Uh, it may be inadvisable to discuss politics or religion in a bar, but discussing them in terms of Mordor makes it much more approachable. We can actually deal with these issues and, 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 uh, in, a, in a less uh, intense way at times. Also, discussions about the imaginary world frequently segue into related problems in the real world. And this is why the cast of Battlestar Galactica was invited to address the United Nations to discuss issues of racial and ethnic uh, and religious tensions, which they were dealing with in the context of an imaginary world. So I think these discussions may generate interesting possible solutions to problems, but more importantly, I think they encourage their fans to think about reimagining the real world in light of the imaginary world. And this is certainly true for Middle Earth. Uh, Middle Earth fanzines use uh, Middle Earth as a touchstone to discuss many issues of imperialism, racism, religion, uh, gender, uh, and, and the environment. Finally, uh, the third point, imaginary worlds remind us that the real world is in many ways an imaginary world. Uh, and this is very important, I think, because all of us gravitate towards thinking about the world, about having beliefs 
about the world that are unchanging and invariant. Uh, this is called essentialist thinking. Uh, essentialist thinking does a lot for us. Essentialist thinking gives us security. It gives us stability. It gives us a sense of identity. But the real world is much more provisional and open than essentialist thinking allows. And living in imaginary worlds reminds us of this fact. So I think when we live in imaginary worlds, we're much more willing to challenge essentialist points of view, uh, which tend to be very exclusionary. You know, whether you conform to the essence or you don't conform, whether you belong to the essence or you don't belong. Uh, nationalism, for example, in the 19th and much of the 20th century was discussed in essentialist terms. The nation was seen to be primordial, eternal, natural. And those who did not belong to the nation were outside of the nation. Obviously, Nazi Germany is one extreme case of this. But inhabiting imaginary worlds trains us to be skeptical of these very easy sorts of essentialist beliefs that we can slip into. And furthermore, it encourages us to entertain alternative points of view. So that's really why I think that uh, Shatner was wrong to scold trekkers and tell them that they ought to get a life. Because they actually had multiple lives. And they were able to experience multiple perspectives from living in multiple worlds. Thank you, and may you all live long and prosper. <laughs>